Thanks uh, so much for agreeing to talk to my class about being a writer and how awesome that is. Oh, I'm happy to do it. It's all I ever want to talk about. <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, I'm going to start off with uh, some of the questions that my students gave me because they're way more interesting than the ones I came up with. <laughs> um, and so uh, the first one that they have for you um, is about when you, if you could think back to when you were in a writing class, uh, what was one topic that you had the most difficult time with? You know what I remember um, is I remember a, a, a writer, a teacher who was a writer, drawing this diagram on a big chalkboard. And it had all these circles and these lines, and it was showing me the arc. Like it was a structure class trying to show me how um, it should go. And I remember drawing, like copying down the notes and realizing that it was like copying down Latin or something else that I had no idea what it meant and it was I realized that um, those visual things for structure don't make sense to me that really I I must I like stories and I've been reading them my whole life so I I have a natural sense of how a story should go and drawing it doesn't help me so I remember that right excellent well that, that should make a lot of sense um, <laughs> right <laughs> Well, there are always, there's drawings in the books, too, you know, drawings about, like, how it, you know, the crescendo, and it doesn't make sense, it doesn't translate to language to me. They're always trying to turn uh, stories into a math equation. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly, and you know what, I'm no mathematician, it turns out. Well, this actually leads up quite nicely to the next question, which is, uh, what, uh, in your opinion, is there any value in including illustrations with short stories? And we might include, um, you know, covers, right? Because I know that you have a new book coming out. And uh, did you have any say in the cover for that? Right. Or is that something that's sort of out of your control? You know, I had a really blissful experience with my first book. A lot of people don't have any choice in their covers. In fact, I met a man the other night. My book is coming out, um, and I'll, I'll, I have it here. I'll show it in a minute. But uh, his his book was also coming out in a couple of weeks. Mine is available for pre-order. His he's he said, yeah, my book's out in a couple of weeks. And I said, well, what's the release date? And he said, oh, I don't even know. And I said, well, you know, tell me about you know the title and the cover. And he was like, well, I hate the cover. I I sent them a picture, but it, it had a man smoking a cigarette, like an old wizened man, and he was smoking a cigarette, and they didn't want to anyone smoking a cigarette on it. So so then he took the cigarette out of the picture, but then they didn't like an old man because they felt that no one would buy, <laughs> buy an old man. And um, so my experience was incredible. Actually, my husband is an artist, and um, our best friend Noah uh, is also an artist. And so I fed them a dinner that is described in my book, which is called The Sin Eater and Other Stories. And after the dinner, my husband took a photograph of the bones, it was, it's lamb that the people eat, and uh, and red wine, and so he took a photograph and then drew it, and then my friend Noah designed the cover out of it. There's also a, a figure of a man, sort of hunched over, like somebody who might need a sin eater. It's actually my husband in front of a bunch of sheets that um, my friend Noah fixed up and uh, changed. But uh, about illustrations, the other great thing is that. My publisher, my husband is this artist, as I said, and my publisher let him create illustrations for each one of my short stories. So this is a story called The New Plague, and this is a feather boa that he um, drew for it. So each story has its own illustration, and the thing is, is that I'm sure other publishers would be like, no way, that's too much trouble. But my publisher was like, yeah, sure, what, what, we'll try it. And there was some complication because um, <laughs> they, they, nobody, none of us really knew how to put illustrations in a book. And so there was darkness, -ish, darkness issues and printing issues. And, um, uh, but the thing is, you know, uh, my husband found he realized that there it's a, it's a very domestic book it's about trouble in domestic life and so he used all these domestic images from a house things you might find in a house like there's a bar of soap and an ear of corn and this hairbrush i just showed you and um i think that what the value might be is that 
you know, you look at a, an image and it makes you wonder what the story's about and it makes you want to seek that image in the story. And um, so that sort of just adds a layer of intrigue, I think, to the story. I don't think a story needs them at all, but I, I love illustrated books. I love graphic novels, too. Well, sort of I, I, an interesting spin, too, right, because... Um, when you've got the illustration being constructed, it's always uh, constructed, as you say, your husband saw the story and then he constructed the image. And so, uh, the, but the reader comes to it the opposite way. The reader sees the image and then is sort of looking at your story through the lens of this other artist, right? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's really true. That's really true. Fascinating. Yeah. So. so Go ahead. Yeah, no, it just seems like I, I'm not sure if it's a lens. I think lens might, I thought maybe an anchor, but really I think lens is a more appropriate metaphor. Yeah, no, I think lens because it does, because it leads you, it points you, it's like an arrow pointing you into a certain uh, idea in the book. There's one, it's this broken glass, especially, that um, you don't actually see till the end of the story. I'm curious to... Um, I haven't, you know, a lot of people haven't seen the book yet. With the, they've read stories of mine, but not with the illustrations. So I'm curious about that um, piece where it's a picture of this broken glass and and um, what they'll make of that. Great, yeah, yeah. Um, so we have sort of, you know, two questions that seem interconnected. So I'll just ask them together. Um, okay. The first is, you know. Uh, how do you come up with ideas for plot and character? And, and the next is, um, how do you write believable dialogue? And they, you know, the, your answer doesn't necessarily need to be interconnected with that, but they seem to me like they, they sort of go with each other. Yeah, they, they do. Well, they're, you know, it's craft, craft, pure craft questions. I think, um, you know, for me, I'm, I get haunted by an image or something that's going on in my life. You know, it's funny. I just started a new story this morning. <laughs> and um, the, I have this the Skype phone call from hell? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's about another hell. I got this <laughs> glass in my foot, you know, on Thanksgiving, and it's still there, and I'm going to have to have surgery now. Oh. And so last night I was thinking about that story of the princess and the pea, you know, she keeps right. having to have all these mattresses. And I sort of feel like that because I'm like, how could there still be glass in my foot? You know, it's the opposite of the princess and the pea. I'm just ignoring it. <laughs> I just keep going about my life. <laughs> I, I add more gel layers to my shoes <laughs> so that I can keep going. And um, so I so that sometimes it will be sparked off by like the memory of another story that exists in the world or I'll be reading something and the way that somebody says something makes me think of an idea. I'm very you know, and I've, I've really learned to loosen up what I can write about. And that helps because your material comes to you. What happens is I turn people into fictional things. If I'm having an argument with someone, I'll take one tiny characteristic of that person and I'll turn them into a character <laughs> on something that I'm working on. Um, so um, it's hard. Like I don't, but there's other people who definitely they'll get just a general idea. They want to write a mystery story, and they'll sit down and they'll they'll plot it out. And that's a great way too. There's there's everybody has their own way. I'm very much I dream a lot. Um, for a while, I was trying to write a series of stories with a dream image in each one of them, um, which ended up turning into a whole book instead about one of those images. So that reminds uh, me a bit about uh, the way that I teach sort of 19th century uh, literature. Yeah. And the way I start off, I start talking about like, okay, well, first there's the authors who were educated in America, like Emerson and Thoreau, and they... Mm -hmm. uh, they always sort of, you know, uh, they were more, as you say, sort of dreamed or imaging images, uh, and and they're not quite sure where they're going, but but they're headed off very confidently. And then the others are, are sort of Poe, who was educated in Europe, and they always very much need a plan before they they write. So Poe was very famous for saying, you know, make sure that you've thought it out through the climax before you've ever put pen to paper. Wow, right. Yes, that would kill me. It would be gone. So in terms of dialogue, though, creating believable dialogue, um, 
what I did is I went to diners and cafes and I really studied. I paid attention. I eavesdropped like crazy. And I wrote down, I made myself write down everything I heard, including the pauses, which I would mark with dashes. And then um, after I did that, then I embarked on like a study where I pulled a book off the shelf and I just looked at how did how did this author do dialogue? And I looked at several of them. And um, I kind of feel like the combination of those two tactics is the best way to figure it out. Because people, you, you could never write all the boring stuff that people say down. Or the, you know, you wouldn't want to have the ums. I mean, I'm, I'm an um ummer. I stutter sometimes. And sometimes, I mean, a stutter could be really useful if the person does it all the time. But you don't want to um, uh, overdo it in your writing. You just want to have a little touch here and there to make each person's dialogue specific to them. And embarking on a study, like give yourself a month where you're studying dialogue and your, your poor friends, you're actually secretly paying attention to how they say things. They think you're listening. Um, that, so I think be that's... sneaky and go out in public and <laughs> exactly. record people when they're not listening, right? Eavesdrop. <laughs> no. Basically eavesdrop. Yeah. That's what I think. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, the bus is good for that, I think. Yes, right. <laughs> the bus is good. The cafeteria is good. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. eavesdrop. Excellent. Okay, great. Um, and so the next question has to do with the writing process. Okay. And, um, you know, there's this careful balance between... Uh, writing and rewriting where you know at first uh, I don't know how if your process is similar to this but for me it's sort of like you know uh, diarrhea of the pen at mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. and then uh, you know at some point I have to you know make sense of what it is that I came up with so the, the short way to put that is how do you know when it's time to revise right yeah you know um yeah, I have a method actually that works for me where I just, yes, I just let it all go. I, I just put it all and I l allow no editors in my mind, right? Like it used to be my grandmother. I have a very Southern grandmother. Well, she's no longer alive. And um, I would imagine her reading it and that would get in my way. So you have to be, you have to identify who will stop you, get rid of them, let it flow. And then, um, and I handwrite everything first. So then I type it. And I read it aloud to myself. And the way I know is if I feel like I've gotten um, the, some idea that I really wanted in there, I don't want to show it to anybody before I feel like I've gotten the idea in there because then they'll think, well, they'll think I don't know what I'm doing, I guess. Or they'll, they'll, I'm afraid they'll send me in the wrong direction. So I have to keep working on it by myself until I, can, I feel that I've said what I wanted to say. And um, and then I have I have a group of people that I send it to, like four or five friends who I really trust. I know they're not going to read my work for their own pleasure, that they're not going to just try and give me advice because they want to be bossy. Uh, you have to look out for some of these people, right? Or they're always trying to tell you to write like them. You have to find good readers for, for yourself. That's yeah. great. No, that's great advice. I think that what you said about that reader in our own head is very true. And, right. Um, you know, and, and then there are certain types of people who, whose agenda is not necessarily having you discover your own uh, voice. And so that's great advice. Right. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, mechanics, uh, what does your writing space look like? And you can choose to answer that in terms of physical being or, you know, right. an abstract metaphysical question, but right. what's, what's yeah. your writing space look like? These are such great questions, by the way. Um, let's see. Well, my physical space always has to have books in it. I have a big old teacher's desk, big old wooden teacher's desk with the old drawers. My husband actually had to cut the legs off of it for me. I was going to, I've been going to the chiropractor for seven months 
<laughs> before I realized that my desk was just simply too high and none of the chairs really worked. And so he just cut the legs down by like four inches. Did you and find anything happen to your productivity at that point? Were you less productive once you were comfortable? Yes, in space right. More? Oh no, once I was comfortable, <laughs> no, it was amazing. It was amazing. You, you really, you can't work for a long time when you're constantly stretching and you know you have to get up and move around. And if you get up and move around, there's always dishes or laundry or cats or children, whatever you have in your house. So, um, yeah, so I, I definitely always have books. And, um, uh, but you know what? I would say that my real space, the true writing, really happens for me in a notebook. That's sort of the metaphysical space in a way, that blank page. Because I can almost close my eyes. It feels like I'm closing my eyes and writing. Um, because I don't think about what I'm writing, I just let it go, and then I'm in a different space. Whereas if I'm typing, it doesn't happen so much for me um, in that way. And um, I do, I, I love it, but it's hard. I mean, writing's so hard, right? It's, it's, it's really this big amorphous, like, you could write anything, right? And so you have to keep, you have to be the one to focus. What was I trying to say? Sometimes I get like a visual image in my, my metaphorical, um, office, I'll have an image of something that I keep returning to that reminds me, this is what I want to write. This is what I want to write. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's excellent. Yeah, that's uh, so at that point, it's certainly, it, it is a focus. Um, I wonder, you know, and that sort of comes back to that other question we had about illustration, right? And how, you know, it's usually constructed uh, by some other artist in response to your work, but uh, right. Some other artists' work may, in fact, become the focal point you have whilst you are writing. Yes, um, yes. Actually, they're in music. Like, I listened to one CD, this violinist, the whole time I was writing a novel. I just listened to that CD. And when I was listening to the CD, I could see a figure running through a swamp and the light of a swamp. And I just, that was how I would start every time I was working on the novel because it just took me to the place. So all these different, finding those clues, whether they're visual or sound, auditory, um, that can really help you focus so quickly. Great, yeah. I have, mm -hmm. uh, let's see here. Um, speaking of metaphysical spaces, uh, have you ever had to deal with writer's block and how did you overcome that? You know what I think? I think writer's block is a variety of other neuroses that take the form of writer's block. Now, um, I know, do you know, um, what's her name? Allison, she wrote The Bone, something The Bone. Anyways, what is her name? She, anyways, she's a famous author and she had writer's block for seven years, and um, which horrifies me. But I also think that her first book was about uh, how she and her siblings were abused and it was this really dark, really hard book, hard to read. I'm sure it was hard to write. And um, so I wasn't all that surprised. And it, and it received all this acclaim. She was a North Carolinian author at the time. And um, I, I just always sort of wondered if it wasn't like she dug so deep into something so hard that she was almost afraid to go back. Um, I think we have other problems, like if the editor's in the room with us, sometimes we, we can get writer's block. Um, we can psych ourselves out for sure. People psych themselves out. All I, hear what you, I hear what you mean. I had writer's block for nine years. It's called grad school. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we right. got a couple of like minutes somebody... left here, and I, I want to hit these last two questions. Okay. Um, did you ever look at a story and think, hmm, this needs more of symbolism, or I need more, you know, I need to personify this toaster or something? Right. Yes, totally. Uh, often I get to, an, in an early draft, I realize that I've basically summarized the scenes. Usually I need more dialogue and then what I call the blue and whites of the eyes, which is both sensory description and figurative language. I usually add that later. I get, just get the story out first and then I add that juicy stuff later. Oh, yeah. Right uh, and the last bit here, uh, what advice do you have for short story writers? Keep writing. Just write. Just go ahead and write. Write reams. Fill notebooks. Write, 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 write. That's Excellent. my main advice. <laughs> Excellent. Well, again, this is a, a, 
Elizabeth Frankie Rollins, and she's got a new book coming out called uh, The Sin Eater? Sin Eater and Other Stories. And other Stories. Thanks yeah. so much for uh, taking the time to be with us, Frankie. Thank you very much. Keep writing, students. Have fun.